Uh, so welcome uh, to our, uh, our morning panel, Governance by Index, Mutual Fund Involvement in Corporate Governance. Um, as many of you may or may not know, uh, more investment uh, in mutual funds obviously means greater influence that mutual funds can exert in the corporate setting. As any good public choice scholar will tell you, power draws rent seeking. So we shouldn't be surprised that mutual funds, particularly the major players, have become the focus of intensifying pressures to uh, exert, well, to exert pressure on behalf of any number of social and cultural goals um, that outside groups might have. Our panel today will discuss the changes in the way we invest, how mutual funds' role has changed um, by choice as well as through some external factors, how corporate rent seekers have responded, and the factors that we uh, should consider in response to uh, those changes. Uh, our uh, panel is uh, Professor Adriana Robertson, Assistant Professor of Law on the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, Sean Griffith, the TJ Maloney Chair in Business Law and the Director of the Fordham Corporate Law Center at the Fordham University School of Law, and Ann Lipton, Michael M. Fleischman, Associate Professor in Business Law and Entrepreneurship at the Tulane University School of Law. We will do about 15 minutes um, for each of our presenters and uh, then we'll have some discussion and open it up for questions. So we'll turn it over to Professor Robertson. All right, well I'm gonna stand because it's early in the morning and if I don't, I fear I'm gonna fall asleep in my suit. So. Why is it not on there? Help. Don't worry, we're pausing your time. All right, well, I'm going to start talking. Uh, all right, so I'm going to sort of focus on the index and index fund piece and the index governance piece uh, of the story uh, because as I'll try to persuade you, kind of thinking about the governance of the index and the fund is then, I think, going to have downstream effects on thinking about what this means for governance. So let's kind of start upstream uh, before we get too caught up in the downstream bit. Now the clicker's not working. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with sort of two key facts that really characterize the capital markets today. And these are sort of the key features. I think it's pretty uncontroversial. Uh, the first is that the three large asset managers, you want to call them the, the big three, the giant three, uh, the three kings, as Caleb called them yesterday, uh, whatever you want to call them, these three asset managers, right, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, together manage a tremendous amount of money. How much money? Well. More or less, if you add up all the shares and all the funds that they're running, you get about 20% of all S&P 500 shares. And that's, that's data from 2017. Uh, it's almost certainly higher now. A lot of this is in sort of passive, scare quotes, index funds. Okay, the second fact um, that is sort of the crucial thing to understand is that uh, U.S. equity index funds have now overtaken their active counterparts. Right? So what does that mean? The quantum of money invested in index funds, and we're talking about domestic equities, is now greater than the quantum of money invested in actively managed domestic equity funds. And then nobody, I think, seriously expects either of these two trends to reverse anytime soon. If anything, you know, they're more or less, uh, the consensus is this is going to continue. So what do we mean when we talk about index funds? And so kind of the paradigmatic idea of an actively managed mutual fund is, you know, the investor goes to our fund manager and implicitly says, look, I want you to pick and choose the stocks that are going to be in my portfolio. Right? You do the portfolio allocation. With an index fund, in contrast, what she's doing is she goes to her fund manager and implicitly says, I don't want you to pick and choose the stocks. I want you to just track that index. Just do whatever that index does, right? Be passive. Now, obviously, these two developments have not gone unnoticed uh, in sort of the literature, in the press, and in other areas. And so there's been an explosion of research in both finance and business law thinking through, well, what are the implications of these two big tectonic shifts? And so a number of different concerns have been studied. And the one that we're kind of interested in today is, well, what does this mean for corporate governance? And why do people even ask this question? Right? What's the idea? Well, the basic idea, and this is sort of a, a crude, cartoonish oversimplification of the story, goes something like, well, you know, if everybody's passive, if everybody's just buying the market, right, then nobody's picking stocks. And if nobody's picking stocks, then, you know, what happens to all the virtues that we thought that the capital markets were providing us, right? Like, who's doing the disciplining? Who's kind of watching managers? Who's making sure that markets are efficient? 
Right? So that's, again, very crudely uh, the story that people are worried about. When everybody's passive, nobody's picking stocks, and all the virtues of stock picking go away. And so the point that I would kind of try to make to you is, you know, not so fast, maybe, uh, index investing actually isn't passive. Right, so we kind of, there's a reason I put scare quotes around passive, it's because it's, it's not really meaningfully passive. And why do I say that? Well, look, even if an investor is going to a fund manager and saying, I want you to track the index, I don't want you to make a lot of decisions, it doesn't mean nobody's making decisions, it just means that the maker of the decisions is the index creator. Right, so somebody is still doing that. And a second fact to keep in mind is that actually the relationship between the fund and the index is not always so straightforward. And so it turns out these asset managers can have substantial influence on the construction of the index. And so what does that mean if we put these facts together? Well, it really means that if we want to understand what's going on with these phenomena, what we need to do is think about, one, the construction of the underlying indices, and two, how the index fund managers are actually behaving. Right? So it's, in other words, a much more complicated story than saying, well, everybody's passive, everybody's just tracking the market, what does that mean? Right? We actually need to start the analysis a step further upstream. So let me tell you a little bit about you know, what is going on with this index investing stuff. So again, basic premise is kind of embarrassingly simple. Indices don't just fall out of the sky, somebody makes them. And making them involves making all sorts of decisions. Right? And there's really no way around this. Even something as simple as, I want to make a large cap domestic equity index. Right? So, okay, do you want to have 100 stocks, 500, 1,000? Right? You have to make that choice. There is no way to not do it. And then as you get more complicated indices, there's just more and more choices that you have to make. Is it bad or wrong or problematic that people are making choices? Not necessarily, right? but it does mean that it's happening. And to ignore it is kind of missing the whole story here. Right? So what does that mean? Well, any index is just a product of the decisions made by its creator. So that means if you're tracking the index, then your portfolio is also a product of the decisions made by its creator. Again, there's no way around it. Right? That's just the way things have to work. So what does this landscape of indices look like? Well, so I wrote this first paper. Uh, and what I did was I wanted to figure out what do these indices actually look like? What are they doing? So I sat down. I got the prospectuses of every domestic equity index fund available for sale in the United States. Am I going to fall down? Yeah, you got it. Oh, well, that would have made it exciting. Um, so the prospectus of every domestic equity mutual fund, it's an index fund available for sale in the country, and I read them. Because right? I wanted to know what they were actually doing. And the other thing I did was I got a hold of all of the methodologies associated with all the indices they were tracking, and I read those too. Because right? I wanted to know what they were doing. So the first thing to see is I had 911 funds and I had 550 indices, which means if you do some heroic arithmetic, on average there are fewer than two funds per index. It's actually a pretty diverse area. And not only are there a lot by number, 550, they're not all doing the same thing. Very much not so. And so for example, you've got indices that are intending to capture many different things. You've got your traditional large cap domestic equities, right, S&P 500, so on and so forth. But then you've got all sorts of different kinds of factor tilts, right? So mid cap uh, value index, right, some kind of momentum index. And then you've got really sort of fun ones like, say, the Activist Guru Investor Index. Uh, it's a real index, and there's a real mutual fund that tracks it. Apologies if anybody owns that fund. Um, so not only do you have indices that are trying to capture lots of different things, but you've also got indices that are targeting the same thing, but doing so in very different ways. So you can look at five different value or growth indices, and they're going to be defining value and growth in five very different ways. Again, is this bad? Well, not necessarily. This is choice. Choice is generally a good thing. But what it does mean is that there are a lot of different things happening in this market. Right? So which index you're actually tracking really, really matters. So what does this mean? If we say, well, you know, everybody's passive. Everybody's buying these index funds. OK, fine. But all these index funds are doing very different things. So this specter of, well, everybody's going to own the market and nobody's picking stocks uh, maybe is a little bit unrealistic when we actually dig into this market. Right. So how can we understand a little bit about this market? Well, very loosely speaking, again, this is sort of another crude overgeneralization. You can think about grouping these 550 or so indices into three sort of buckets. You've got well-known indices with large, broad, 
client bases. That would be your, you know, your S&P 500, MSCI, all companies, so on and so forth. Then you've got the single purpose, what I like to call the, the single purpose indices. Right? This index exists so somebody can track it. And finally, at the extreme, affiliated indices. And this is sort of the fund tracks an index that its affiliate creates. Right? And so, again, don't think of these as really sharply different things. Uh, the better way, I think, to think about it is you've got a continuum. And somewhere along the line, you draw some lines and you say, okay, well, this is category A, category B, category C, but close to the cutoffs, right, they bleed into one another, right? So where you call the dawn is a little bit arbitrary. But loosely speaking, it's sort of a useful way to think about it. <coughs> so what's going on with these single purpose indices? Well, about 80% of the ones in my sample that I read about, they were tracked by one and only one fund, right? And so again, the idea that everybody's doing the same thing, not so. Increasingly, right, so the paradigm we think of an index fund is, well, there's some index out there in the world, right, and I go and track it. That's not really what's going on anymore. Right? So increasingly what's going on is I come to Sean and I say, hey, Sean, I'd really like for you to make an index with the following characteristics so that I can make an index fund to track it. Right? And he'll say, all right, well, here's how much I'm going to charge you and I'm going to do that for you. And, and again, that's fine. Maybe that's a, a decent way to run a market. But let's not kid ourselves, right? That's very different, again, from this paradigm of passively holding the market. At the extreme, what you've got are, as I said, it's kind of like my right hand makes the index and my left hand tracks the index, and we call that sort of passive index investing. It's perfectly legal. There might be very good reasons for doing it. Uh, but again, not really this paradigm of passively holding the market. So if this sounds a lot like active management by another name, it's because it is. Right? And so, you know, the line between this and a traditional actively managed fund um, is kind of very blurry. Okay, so what about these large, well-known indices, right? Surely this is not the case for the S&P 500. Surely that's a, a different story. And it is very much a different story. It's a much more complicated story. Right? Again, not simple. And you've still got the problem that somebody has to make this index. Right? Somebody is still making decisions. There's no way around that. And it turns out that a lot of these big, well-known indices are constructed with quite a lot of discretion in them. So just to give you an example, I wrote another paper just looking at the S&P 500, and there it turns out that about 5% of the index, as sort of the most conservative estimates that I can generate, is just pure discretion. So is that 5% big or small? Well, I don't know. $3.4 trillion tracking the index, 5%, you're looking at over $150 billion of pure discretion. That's sort of non-trivial, I would say. Again, not necessarily bad, uh, but there's an awful lot of decision making happening there in a way that we wouldn't really think of as passive. So what does that mean? Well, it means the governance of this index, how the index goes about making its decisions, really, really matters, right? Because that's what's channeling the funds at the end of the day. So how does that govern? I keep using this clicker even though I know it doesn't work. How does that decision making process happen? Well, so public disclosures are, uh, shall we say, thin. Uh, that'd be a polite way to put it. There's basically none. And so you can contrast that to the governance of a public company. Again, they're not public companies. So there's no particular reason to think that they should be giving you the same disclosures as a public company. But if you want to use that as a benchmark when you're thinking about governance, we are sort of, there is daylight between the governance of the index and the governance of a traditional public company. What they do do, and again, I know this basically from <coughs> talking to them, uh, they have consultations with their clients. Who are their clients? Well. Basically, the people that pay them licensing fees. Who are those? People that either want to track the index, right? So these would be index fund managers, and people that want to compare themselves to the index, right? People that want to use it as a benchmark, largely active managers, right? And so what are they doing? Well, they're trying to balance the interests of their clients, right? They're not running a charity, right? They're trying to profit maximize or trying to make their clients happy. <coughs> and so that's sort of what they do. They're balancing these different interests. Asset managers, though, can and do threaten to change providers. Right? And they do sometimes change providers. So there is a real threat. Uh, so it's not the case that these decisions at the index level are made with no attention to what the funds want. Right? It's much more of a dialogue. But at the end of the day, of course, the ultimate decision-making process is a black box. It's not like you can go and get the minutes. Right? Like, that's not a thing in this space. So you know, I've done some work and some work in progress. Happy to chat more about that later on what I think, what it seems like they might be doing. But broadly speaking, you know, there's no sort of report that comes out of like how the S&P 500 committee makes its decisions. Okay. So, you know, what are the takeaways? Since I'm kind of running out of time, um, index investing is just not—it's not passive. Right? Somebody is still making decisions. What's important is that the locus of the decision making has shifted. 
And so calling something an index fund, saying we've switched to passive or index investing, and what does that mean for governance? Right? Well, you know, we're kind of getting ahead of our skis a little bit if we do that. Right? Because the first thing we need to do is figure out how this asset management is happening. What's actually different about this world that we now live in? Right? Let's get a handle on that first. Right, so calling something an index fund is actually only the beginning of the analysis. It's not the end of the story. <coughs> the index fund label can sometimes be kind of misleading, right? Because we say index and we throw up our hands and say, ah, nobody's picking stocks anymore. No, somebody is still picking stocks. Right? What we need to do is focus on that picking, what's actually happening and right? how specific decisions are actually being made. And so I think, you know, that's sort of what I mean when I talk about the upstream portion of this analysis. But I think that's got to be the starting point of the analysis of what do we want to do about what you know, has happened in the mutual fund space. Uh, first, we need to figure out how are these funds actually behaving. And so with that, um, why don't I pass the baton on to Sean. Okay. The end and the new beginning, uh, maybe. Uh, how, do you know how to mini minimize it, Adriana? I don't know. Somebody else can do it. If you hit escape, it'll... Escape. I'm doing that. Nope. Okay. Then I'm not going to get that. Okay. <laughs> get out of that. So let me just say while uh, we get uh, maybe ready, um, is uh, maybe control alt delete? That might work. Um, ooh, task manager. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's, uh, this is a real treat to be presenting um, uh, to this crowd. Um, I think of the Federalist Society as a wonderful organization, but uh, often um, public law focused um, and, uh, and with excellent public law programming. And this is kind of a private law question, but um, I hope to, I, mean, I think that we will show, this panel will show with lots of important uh, implications um, that, are, that are public in important ways. Um, and it's great to be on this panel with these folks whose work uh, I admire and use uh, and, as well in mind. So I'm addressing the same question, uh, which is basically uh, how should we think about um, index funds or mutual funds more broadly in corporate governance? Um, and it's an important question because, as Jeremy said, uh, they increasingly own everything. Um, the, the biggest, um, uh, and Adriana said this too, the biggest funds own 25 to 30 percent of the market as a whole, and the biggest funds um, own 5 percent of each of the largest uh, companies in the market, the, 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 the 500 index. So my paper is a, um, an exploration in how we should think about the question of how these um, fund intermediaries should interact with corporate governance. I think an interesting, uh, an important question to ask first, though, is how is this different from um, debates that we've had before about the role of institutional investors in, in corporate governance. And wh one thing that's different here is that um, these are, st wh what's happening in um, um, index funds um, uh, voting is that there are stakeholder concerns, the concerns of non-shareholder constituencies like the environment, uh, like social type interests that are being pressed, but they're not being pressed by uh, interest groups outside of the shareholder constituency, they're being pressed by shareholders. Um, and those are not retail investors whose idiosyncratic preferences um, wash out in the law of large numbers. Uh, these are concentrated institutional owners pressing uh, these sorts of concerns, along with others. And, and these institutional owners, the, the first generation literature on institutional investors, where Bernie Black and others were writing about the promise and peril of institutional investors, uh, basically, all, at the end of the day, had to address the question of why uh, institutional investors don't do anything. So what's different is that they're actually doing stuff. Um, uh, these institutional investors, these mutual funds in particular, are voting. Um, and they are investing in stewardship programs. So what's stewardship? Well, they're hiring groups within the fund to decide how they should vote on the various kinds of proposals that come up at their portfolio companies year after year. And then they're voting uh, on those, uh, those um, 
those shares. So my question in my paper is how should we think about it? So here's, a, here's an institutional asset manager. That's Larry Fink from BlackRock. There he is on TV, on CNBC, a real interview. He is, as you might see in the mountains in the background, at Davos. And what he said uh, from his perch at Davos was that every company must show that it makes a positive contribution to society. Companies must benefit all of their stakeholders, employees, customers, and the communities with which, in which they operate. Now, Black BlackRock controls over 5% of all the companies in the S&P 500, and its vote matters a lot. And one thing that, just to give one example, one thing that BlackRock is out in front on are gun issues. Um, and one thing that BlackRock cares, one, one type of shareholder proposal that BlackRock has historically supported is to raise the age, uh, the minimum age of gun buy purchasers to 21. Now, in many states, it's 18. So if BlackRock is, when BlackRock is successful in pushing that on its companies like Walmart, what does that mean? Well, it means that Walmart has agreed, because BlackRock has forced it to agree, not to sell guns to anyone between the ages of 18 and 21, even, it might, even though it might be legal in some states. In other words, Walmart is foregoing profits on sales of, of those uh, firearms to those people as a result of an interest foisted upon it by its uh, investor community. Um, in other words, it's putting retirees and college people saving for college behind the uh, interest of its investor base. So my question is really, well, uh, should, should these institutional intermediaries engage in voting in these sorts of things? Uh, how, should they be doing it all? If, if they are doing it, how much? And um, if so, uh, when? So the way to think about this, I think, is structurally. Um, what's a mutual fund? Well, it's an intermediary between the investors and the, um, the companies that produce the return for the investors. Now, when you have an intermediary, you have an agent and you have a principal. So the principal are the investors. The agent is the intermediary. And, um, and what's interesting about the mutual fund, though, is that it takes the power to vote. Not only the power to vote, but also the other corporate powers vote sell, all the other investor powers vote sell sue. But the power to vote, it separates from the ultimate, beneficial, um, the ultimate beneficiary of the, um, of the company's uh, efforts, the investors. And so this is kind of a separation of ownership and control, which in corporate law we normally think of as a terrible idea, right? When you separate the economics from the power to vote, you get weird consequences, and we try not to do that. But in mutual funds, they do it all the time. Now, why is that OK, and why aren't people screaming about it? And the reason is that the mutual fund is thought to solve a problem, and the problem is rational investor apathy. Uh, individual investors don't have an incentive, because they're too small and they control too little of a stake, to invest in learning anything about the companies that they own and voting those shares. So what the, uh, the, uh, the idea is that the institutional intermediary solves that problem, which is really an information problem. So that's the beginning of my analysis. Um, when should the institutional intermediary, the fund, engage in corporate governance voting? And the answer is when they have an information advantage as to solve the rational apathy problem. And the other time is when they can presume a common purpose on the part of their investors. So with regard to the information advantage, um, when would that be? That would be in situations where they have better access to information, uh, where they have maybe better analytical skill with regard to the particular type of information being presented, or just a better incentive to invest in acquiring um, uh, or understanding the information that's presented to them. Um, the common purpose, well, investors have all kinds of purposes, right? We all have all kinds of things that we care about, but as investors, what we're trying to do is maximize our wealth, unless we invest for some other purpose, uh, ex ante. Um, but, um, and wealth maximization is a constraint then. You would think that if the principals are investing, if the best you can presume on the part of principals is that they are investing to uh, maximize their wealth, that should um, constrain the agent. Um, and the agent is a mutual fund, and so the mutual fund should be constrained by wealth maximization. Now, there's an objection here, which is, well, maybe um, wealth maximization in the context of a mutual fund should be thought of at the fund level and not at the firm level. Um, but I think that's not true. I think it's not true for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, as Adriana said, uh, fund families, so BlackRock or Vanguard, they offer not one fund uh, but many. So here's an a example. So here is BlackRock funds. You see the 500 index fund, and all these different funds have different investor bases. So you've got the 500 index fund in the middle. Um, you might have a growth fund, an, a dividend fund, an uh, energy fund, and a tech fund. All these are pa passive in the sense that they are tracking an index of energy companies or tracking an index of uh, tech companies, but they're different from each other in their objectives. Um, 
Uh, and so what, what does this tell us? This tells us that no fund uh, simply equals the market, right? And that's one of the implications, I think, from Adriana's excellent work. And another thing is that, well, these different funds' interests will often be in tension and conflict with each other, and Anne has an excellent paper where she makes that argument. For example, the, um, the energy fund might want to continue to produce uh, fossil fuel energy, but the tech fund might want to produce solar panels instead. Right? So they might have offsetting interests with regard to certain kind of climate votes. Um, growth funds might want uh, to avoid high risk, high return investment strategies. Um, or, sorry, growth funds might want that, but dividend funds might want to avoid it because they want stable capital, uh, capital growth, um, and, and so on. Um, so what does this tell us? This tells us that, look, y you, can't, you can't just elide the interests of the fund with the market. They're different from each other. Um, funds have different characteristics. And not only that, you can't elide the interests of the market with society, um, because uh, obviously there are different uh, interests which may be traded off here. OK, but maybe, so the objection continues, but maybe we should still, within each fund, maybe within each fund, maybe advisors should vote to maximize portfolio wealth um, uh, of that fund, whatever it is. Okay, so we, we no longer should think about BlackRock across the board, but within the particular BlackRock fund, uh, maybe we want the, the managers to maximize the wealth of that, of that portfolio rather than the wealth of the whole, uh, the whole, um, the whole uh, of individual firms in the portfolio. There are only two problems with that. One of them is that it's probably illegal, and the other one is that it's probably impossible. So the way to see that is to imagine a matrix. You can imagine a, a voting situation. The vote might benefit the firm. It might harm the firm. And the vote might benefit the portfolio. It might harm the portfolio. So those are sort of four possible outcomes there. If you map them onto a matrix, you can see certain kinds of implications. The first one is that fund managers will naturally implement box one and box two. They'll do everything to benefit the firm. They have all kinds of incentives to benefit the firm, including their compensation, including to avoid activism and stuff like that. They're going to do all that stuff in box one and box two without pressure from their investors. Um, the part with regard to illegality is that any time that, that you would want to ask the firm to harm itself, uh, that might be a violation of the fiduciary duty just by asking them. Now, you might have a fiduciary duty if you're a large enough investor to be treated as a controller. But even if the investor doesn't have that fiduciary duty, management does. So an investor can't get management to do something that would harm the firm to benefit the portfolio. That would be a violation of the manager's fiduciary duty. And so it's illegal. It doesn't work. It's also impossible, right? Because in order to figure out how to benefit the portfolio, by harming the firm, you have to do a pretty complex calculation. You have to calculate the effect of the policy change on the subject firm, the firm that's making it, and then you have to take that policy change and figure out its effect on every other firm in the portfolio, so 499 different firms. And then you have to adjust for the weight of each one of those firms in the portfolio. And then you have to consider that in light of all the adaptations that would be made in the second round after the change had been made. And then all of that without any private information uh, of any man that any manager possesses. That is an information problem I submit that is impossible to solve. So that suggests to me the outcome there is that we should maximize only for firms that mutual funds should seek to maximize only for firms within their portfolio. And so putting that together with the information intuition, there are some basic implications on how mutual funds should vote on the things that they ordinarily are asked to vote upon. Here are those things. So what are basic things that come up in voting? Well, there are contests. What's a contest? It's when a hedge fund activist comes after the fund and says, you should change what, or the firm, and says, you should change what you're doing at the firm uh, because we think this would be better. That's a, a hedge fund activist contest, or like an M&A, an attempt to buy the company. Um, so thinking about information and purpose, should mutual funds have the discretion to vote in that situation? I say yes because that's a situation where lots of high quality information is forced out by the contestants in the contest, the two sides in the, in the uh, attack. And so that's high quality information that in fact a mutual fund intermediary has an advantage in processing. So there's an information advantage and the purpose is simply wealth maximization of the firm. That's what both sides want in a contest. So that you, I would say give them discretion to vote in that situation. But don't give them discretion to vote on environmental and social proposals. Why not? Well, first of all is the purpose problem, right? These are, if they, insofar as these proposals come from a place other than wealth maximization, we cannot presume that the investor base shares th that view. 
Number two, um, the information, there's paltry information given in environmental and social proposals. They're 500 words or less. They basically don't affect the operations of the company. It's really about, I think, something else. So in, um, uh, uh, what should we do, though, if we're not going to have mutual funds vote on it? Well, look, as we saw in the prior matrix, um, um, managers have every incentive to maximize firm value if there's an environmental change, that, uh, environmental uh, policy that would maximize firm value. Managers are just going to do it anyway, right? Because they have every incentive based upon their compensation, their desire to avoid um, takeover to maximize firm value. So what we should do in the case of environmental social proposals is just defer to management's recommendation. Um, what about governance proposals? Now, this is the hard one, I'm, I'm, and this is the one that's very debatable, and it would be fun to debate in the Q&A. Um, but there's low-quality information here. Uh, um, the, there's not high-quality information. The, all we have is basically issue-specific information. We know that um, staggered boards are bad on the whole. But we also know from the research that we can't say on the basis of that fact that staggered boards are bad at any one firm. It seems like the combination of governance plus management is firm specific. No one, indexes don't have that firm specific information, so indexes don't have an information advantage with regard to governance. They shouldn't vote, they should. Um, but there's a problem here. You can't just defer to management as in the case of environmental and social proposal where management is unconflicted because management has a conflict in governance. Governance proposals typically seek to take away managerial authority or more, make them more subject to takeover. So we have to abstain. Mutual funds which should abstain in the situation. And then there's other stuff, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, but which we could. And I have one minute left, so I'm going to really quickly just say, if that's, so what I'm, my argument here is this is the set of defaults that we should see. Um, mutual funds should only vote with their discretion on contests. They should not vote in other situations. They should either defer to management or they should abstain, depending upon the context. That's the default arrangement that I argue investors would prefer. So you can ask, why don't we see it? And the answer, of course, is regulation um, uh, and also uh, sticky defaults. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are rules by the uh, Department of Labor and the Securities and Exchange Commission that would make, uh, that, that make it difficult for this um, default arrangement to come about. And we can talk more about what they are in the Q&A, if you like. But also, importantly, there are sticky defaults. What do I mean by that? Well, the parties are unlikely to change the default, not because they wouldn't want to change it if they thought about it, but because they don't think about it, because voting is a, right, retail vote, retail investors have a rational apathy problem ex post when it comes to voting. They also have it ex ante when it comes to stating their preferences with regard to voting. Um, that gives funds the opportunity, as Jeremy suggested, to seek rents, to vote in ways that will strategically seek future investors. Uh, it also gives large funds the opportunity to use stewardship programs as a kind of um, uh, barrier to entry. Um, so my argument is that we should reset the default rule, but allow investors to opt into whatever arrangement ex ante they would want. You could imagine the creation of stewardship funds that invest a lot of money in extra stewardship, where passive funds promise to invest piles and piles and piles of money in researching all this stuff, but we don't see that. We also don't see the S&P 500 staggered, uh, unstaggered board index. Um, what that might tell us is it's a revealed preference, right? You can't make money doing that because there's that cost of doing it um, outweighs the benefit that you would get. So, thanks. I'm going to stand here, but I don't have PowerPoint, so at least we don't have to struggle with that part. And um, okay, so um, my talk overlaps in some ways with what Sean just uh, said, but I disagree with him on like 90% of it, so this will be fun. Um, okay. <laughs> So, um, we've all heard the statistics, that's why we even have this panel, which is that the big mutual funds, BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard, State Street, um, collectively control huge amounts of corporate stock. Um, my stats might be a little out of date, but the most recent numbers that I saw had BlackRock controlling 5% blocks of more than half of United States publicly listed companies. Vanguard has 5% blocks of over 40% of them. Um, when you take BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street together, um, they have the largest block of stock in four 40% of all of the United States listed companies and are collectively the largest shareholder for 88% of the S&P 500. When you throw in a couple of others like Fidelity and T. Rowe Price, you have the top shareholders of basically every public company. Um, the dominance of these shareholders has been described as a concentration of corporate ownership not seen since the days of J.P. Morgan and J.D. Rockefeller. 
Except that is misleading, as Sean illustrated, because when we say that BlackRock has 5% of the S&P 500, what we mean is that multiple BlackRock funds added together have 5% of the S&P 500. Each individual fund may only have a tiny fraction of that amount. And we paper over that distinction most of the time because all these different fund families have these centralized governance teams um, that determines how all their funds across, across their stewardship will vote on a particular issue. Now, first, I'm gonna say, I just exaggerated. That's not really true. Um, some fund families vote in lockstep with each other. Um, some families like Vanguard and Fidelity, they kind of divide the active funds from the passive funds and they have like one set of voting guidelines for the actives and one for the passives. Um, there are going to be policies about when individual fund managers can depart from the house view um, and the families will vary as to how much freedom they give their house managers to do that. But we can say in general, in very broad strokes, avoiding nuance, um, mutual fund sponsors tend to cent uh, centralize their voting policy. Um, and, that, and they tend to send their instructions down to the fund level as to how to vote their shares, and they make it more or less difficult for an individual fund manager to depart from that view. And that's why these mutual fund companies are so powerful, because they coordinate all their voting across these funds. And I have a concern about this arrangement, which is that each mutual fund is a separate entity with different investor beneficiaries, and these funds may have different interests, and a centralized voting policy fails to take into account the ways that the funds have really different preferences at the fund level. So first, we have to talk about what those preferences are or what they should be, and here is the first place where I disagree with Sean. Um, I think those preferences have to operate at the fund level rather than the company level. As in, funds should be thinking about what benefits the fund and benefits the fund beneficiaries and not what benefits any individual company in the portfolio. If you invest in a mutual fund, you care about the fund's performance, not the performance of individual companies within the fund. And that's how this regulatory system is designed. When a fund investor receives a prospectus and, a, and their annual report from their, um, from their mutual fund, they're about fund performance. There are charts about fund performance. There are talks about fees that you're paying out and how much that is affecting your fund performance. They're not going company by company. In the very back, it'll have a list of all the companies and how like their price may have changed in the last six months or a year. But the entire focus of this very heavily regulated document is on fund performance. Um, Jay Clayton, head of the SEC, has said that he wants to make sure that funds voting decisions maximize the fund's value for shareholders, not individual companies' value. When the SEC adopted regulations requiring that mutual funds disclose their votes on each individual issue to the public, um, they said their reasons for doing that was so that retail investors could determine if their existing fund managers are adequately maximizing the value of their shares, meaning the fund shares, not company shares. Um, the SEC just put out new guidance on proxy voting responsibilities and also indicated that the advisor has a duty to the client or the fund or, or the fund, the holding vehicle. And this is true under ERISA as well. And this matters because a lot of investors, they invest through an ERISA plan. And um, ERISA requires that any ERISA trustee advance the interests of the plan, not the individual companies within the plan. So that's my first premise, that um, the duty is at the fund level. Second is a vote for what benefits a particular company is not necessarily a vote for what benefits the fund. Um, and there are some fairly obvious examples here. Suppose a fund owns a share of both Tesla and SolarCity. And SolarCity is in financial trouble and it might go bankrupt and Tesla makes a bid to acquire SolarCity's shares. In order for the deal to close, the shareholders on both sides, on Tesla side and the SolarCity side, have to vote in favor that Tesla is gonna acquire SolarCity. But maybe, Hypothetically, Tesla is seriously overpaying for SolarCity, and it's a really bad deal from the, from the Tesla side. But also, it's a fantastic deal from the SolarCity side because they're going to go bankrupt if they don't get acquired. If your fund hosts, holds shares of both Tesla and SolarCity, you should be either for or against that deal, depending on which weight you're. If you if you're have Tesla and Solar City, but you have a lot more uh, Solar City, you should be voting your Tesla shares in favor of the acquisition, even though you think it's an incredibly bad deal for Tesla, because that's what's going to maximize the value of your fund. And this is, by the way, not in any way a hypothetical. Um, uh, th uh, this is what actually happened when Tesla was contemplating its takeover of Solar City. The directors of Tesla, which very bad deal for Tesla, were very aware um, that they had shareholders who held both sides of the deal, and they actually 
looked at like a chart of who held both sides of the deal when they were designing the deal because they were trying to calculate whether their investors would buy it. And what they were taking into account was, of course, our Tesla shareholders will buy it because our Tesla shareholders are Solar City shareholders at the same time. Um, climate change. Um, some companies like Exxon may take action that harms other companies like property insurers in Texas and Louisiana. And so I might reasonably say I'm going to vote for Exxon to be more, you know, carbon neutral or whatever because that's going to benefit all the other industries that I own shares in that are going to be harmed by climate change. And they do admit they're doing this. Um, um, every now and then you have like these companies that say I think climate change is a system, uh, mutual fund companies that will say I think climate change is a systemic risk and it's a affecting my portfolio, and so I'm going to vote my shares to minimize uh, climate change. So um, Sean thinks these kinds of issues are unknowable by institutions, and we should leave it to, um, but I, I, I think there are some things that you can know, and you can see how things like climate change are affecting the portfolio. So, and this isn't just true of mutual funds. This is true of any diversified investor. And, um, any diversified investor is going to care about their portfolio as a whole. They're not going to care about the individual companies within the portfolio. Um, but it does mean that funds have incentives to vote for non-wealth maximizing actions at individual companies if they think it will benefit the portfolio overall. Um, and I'm, I'm OK with that. It sits uneasily with corporate law doctrine which kind of sort of assumes that shareholders vote to maximize wealth at a particular company. Um, but I'm, I don't have a problem with funds voting to maximize the wealth of the portfolio. I think that's what their investors want. But that leads to the next conclusion, which is that not all mutual funds within a complex have the same preferences. It's going to depend on the fund's particular strategy and balance of investments. There are some fairly obvious examples. One fund might actually sell itself as a socially responsible fund, and another fund may not. And these funds should probably have different voting systems. One fund might include a mix of stock and debt from a single company, and the other um, just has stock in that company. They should have different preferences. Some funds might be act actively managed, and therefore they have a lot of high turnover, so they're relatively short-term owners, and they should be in favor of short-term financial engineering um, things that, that give a quick boost to the stock price. They may want to remove anti-takeover devices so that um, a hedge fund activist can easily get a foothold and, and do a short-term boost to the stock price. Other funds may be longer-term holders, and they may be concerned that activist attacks are short-term oriented, and they want longer-term measures. They may prefer things like staggered boards and takeover protections. The problem is, when all funds within a fund family centralize their voting decisions, these distinctions get lost. And I believe that's a potential violation of the sponsor's fiduciary duties to each individual fund. And I think this is especially likely to be true because, as Adriana points out, even index funds aren't even really broad indexes. They're really very idiosyncratic, which means these funds may have really idiosyncratic, correct strategies. So there are a bunch of really interesting empirical findings about this. Um, there's not nearly enough work on it, but what work there is is, is very telling. So um, for example, I'm sure everyone's heard of this antitrust argument. It's like you know all the news these days that is an antitrust violation that you have like the same whole, like the same stockholders own stock in Delta and Southwest and American Airlines and so forth. And does that ultimately result in higher prices for consumers because one, because you have the same shareholders in each company and they don't want their companies to compete? Everyone's heard that. That's study. There's fights about whether or not this study is empirically accurate. I have no idea who's right, but let's just assume they're right for now. That studies, though all of the studies, those are done at the family level. Those are not fund level studies. They say there's overlapping ownership across all the airlines, but what they mean is BlackRock as a whole owns all the airlines, and Vanguard as a whole owns own the airlines. It's very possible within the funds, they are overweight, one or the other, and they should have different preferences. Socially responsible funds, a lot of them vote just like regular funds. They vote because they're part of a complex, because BlackRock has an ESG fund, and it votes all the shares the same way, which means its ESG fund is not voting for particularly socially responsible stock. When a fund family owns both stock and bonds in a company, um, that has become an acquisition target, um, they're more likely to accept a lower premium for the stock if, they, if, if, the tar if the acquisition will shore up the value of the bonds. And that, once again, is at the family level, which means they are taking the, pure, the, the votes of the stock fund and using it to shore up the bond fund. 
If a family across all of its funds owns shares in two companies, it's more likely that the firms will merge and will merge at a lower premium, and merger is more likely to use stock as compensation rather than cash. Um, um, uh, so, and finally, institutional investors who own stock and bonds in the same firms um, at the family level, not the fund level, are more likely to favor managerial compensation policies that minimize risk taking because they own both stock and bonds. If they, if at the family level they own just stock, they will want <laughs> compensation policies that take risk. So they're basically, what we're seeing here is that they vote in a way that treats it as though all their funds are one big portfolio instead of the separate portfolios that they actually are. Um, and when I say Tesla stockholders and the Solar City stockholders, that was at the family level, not the fund level. Um, there's actually one Delaware case. I'll just say this really quickly. This came up. This actually came up. T. Rowe Price held stock. Um, in an acquirer, and it held stock in the target, but like the funds were different. There were funds that just had target stock, and there was a fund that held both. And it actually did negotiate a price at which it would sell its shares acro um, across all its funds, even though one fund held stock in both the target and the acquirer, and thus with obviously a very different interest than the fund that held stock just in the target. Um, okay, so this is definitely happening, and the question is, does the centralization actually violate the sponsor's fiduciary duties to the funds? Um, and it's actually, I think it's kind of complicated because I think funds can rationally choose this system. Like if you were to ask what the funds want, they might rationally decide they want to centralize uh, their votes, even if they, it, it means sometimes the votes are less, op less than optimal. A couple reasons. First, some issues really might stretch across every fund. So this is again the climate change example. Other than something like the energy fund, I think a climate change is a systemic risk that's going to affect the vast majority of the portfolio, and I think that it might very well, that kind of thing, be reasonable to say, you know, at least across most, maybe not every fund, but across most funds, it's reasonable to centralize. Second, by centralizing their funds, the fund's votes, it gives the, the family leverage with companies. Companies will pick up the phone when BlackRock calls because they know that BlackRock is centralizing its votes. If it was voting each fund separately, 1% here, 1% there, they probably wouldn't pick up the phone. That might be better for the investors in the funds, even if occasionally the vote doesn't go their way. So they might rationally choose it. Um, and it might be better to standardize some governance practices. It might be easier for the world, for every investor, if it was standard that we didn't have staggered boards for the most part. I'm making that, but you know, obviously there's a big disagreement about that. But they maybe, and so maybe once again, funds would willingly say, I will sacrifice the perfect vote for the benefits of some kind of standardization that helps all of us. My problem then is that that, um, isn't actually being done. It's not like the funds are actually sitting down choosing, well, do I want to centralize or not? Do I get benefit? You know, they're not making that serious trade off. No one's really thinking about it. So that leaves um, what the SEC thinks, and it's kind of complicated there. Um, but let's just say for a very long time, they had uh, regulations in place and guidance that never uh, directly addressed any of this, but sort of suggested it was OK. And certainly funds, they post what their voting policies are. It's not a secret that they centralize. And the SEC never said boo about it. Um, but recently, they started to kind of change um, what they're doing. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Roisman gave a speech recently where he actually said he was concerned about the process of centralization. And then in August of 2019, last year, um, uh, the SEC uh, actually put out a new guidance on proxy voting where it actually had several sentences um, about how um, the investment advisor's duty is at the fund level and it shouldn't have a centralized voting policy if that's not to the best interest of each individual fund. Um, so the SEC is just now starting to get hit to this issue, and I guess we may see changes going forward. And uh, that's that. And again, thank you to, uh, to each of our presenters. Um, I think first, it uh, would be ideal to allow the presenters to ask questions of each other if they might. Um, John, I don't know if you want to address the, uh, the, the areas in which you and Ann uh, disagree. I, I think. And, and I, I will point out, I, I heard uh, Sean's paper at a panel two days ago, right? It was on Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the terminology, the, the firm versus portfolio terminology, I got a little confused on at the time. And I, uh, my guess is that you and Anne don't actually disagree that much on her first point, I think because the terminology is confusing. Um, what, what you mean by firm versus what you mean by, uh, by portfolio. So if you could 
you can address that, yeah. whether, whether you actually disagree, whether you and Ann actually disagree there or not. Yeah, well, well I, I mean, Ann and I do disagree, and I'm glad okay. for that, and I knew we would. Uh, Ann and I are law school classmates and friends, so this is, uh, I expected this. Um, but I, I want to just say that I do agree with Ann that funds should maximize fund value, but I think that there's an ends and a means distinction to be made, right? That's the end. The end is to maximize fund value, but when voting is the means by which the fund is going to do that, that, then it has to do it by focusing on the firm level, the portfolio firm level. So I'm, my distinction, Jeremy, is fund and firm. And I agree with Anne that the, the goal is uh, to, uh, to, uh, to create value at the fund level, but the way that that is done through voting is by considering the effect at the firm level. And just the two examples, just to take one more in a second, the two examples that Anne gave, the Tesla Solar City example, that's a great example, but I think that Anne would agree with me that that's an example of a conflict at the, at the corporate law level. And indeed, Indeed, it is treated. It, there are indications that it would be treated that way uh, by the by the Delaware Judiciary when it gets there. That in particular case, there's some dicta in, in that case where um, uh, Slights, I think, says, you know, we need to think about this when this when there uh, and that has implications for how those votes would be treated. Um, on the ESG climate example uh, argument that she made. You know, I, I just think it's much more likely that when funds say they're voting on climate or whatever, that what they're really doing is um, is, is staking out those votes to attract future investors. Um, Bar Barzuza, Curtis, and Weber have a paper about how funds sort of do this strategically to attract millennials. And I was surprised that anyone thought that millennials had any money. But, um, <laughs> but it turns out that they're going to inherit just a pile of money in the very near future. And it might be that BlackRock and so on are staking out positions to appeal to them in the future. I think that is an example of rent seeking. Unless that, that preference is an ex ante preference of the fund, before anyone goes in, that preference needs to be stated in a formal way. If you shift that preference after, the, after people are in, you're just taking retirees' money. Right, shifting the purpose that you're investing in order to get future investors who help that helps the advisor, right? That helps BlackRock, but it's not like BlackRock kicks that kicks those returns back into the fund investors. And the, the other thing is, you know, Ann said my objection to um, climate and stuff is because I think it's unknowable. That's part of it. I do think that we don't actually know how. I mean, I mean, once you do the math, try to figure out how climate affects each firm in a weighted way and how the the, the climate proposal would change things. I do think that's unknowable. But I, what I really think here is that the when when it's regards an environmental and social proposal, the relevant information is not whether the proposal is going to fix the thing, and I, you know, I think it's not. I think the relevant information is actually the investor's trade-off between private profit and like the public purpose of the proposal. And that information to, is distributed to the investors, and there is no information advantage on the part of the, of the intermediary in, un, in knowing that. So it's, it's unknowable because like, it's hard to figure out, but it's also unknowable by the intermediary because that type of knowledge, insofar as what it really is, is preferences with regard to a trade-off, does not reside with the intermediary, but rather with the investor. And you could only get that information by uh, opting in ex ante. If, if I might follow up on that, and, and I know I, I, Anne, I think, deserves an opportunity to comment if she wants, but I wonder if, on that last point of yours, uh, Sean, whether you think the reduction in transaction costs in terms of technology and dispersal of information, the, the ready uh, access that, that all investors have to certain types of information will make that point even more salient as we move forward. So I would say yes. Uh, Caleb has an interesting work on this, and I have a working paper on this also. So I think the possibility of doing some kind of pass-through voting in the context of environmental and social would be another way of dealing with that knowledge problem insofar as the trade-off is down at the investor level. And did you want to comment? Yeah, um, I think that um, they have to maxim cast their votes to maximize the fund value. That, like, I mean, that would, I mean, yeah, the Tesla Solar City, there was a conflict, and there is a lawsuit over it, but like, Clearly, um, and, and that's a real problem for corporate law. It's a real problem for corporate law in terms of what they're going to do with shareholder votes. But that's not a problem for the actual investor. The actual investor doesn't change. What happens is corporate law says we're going to look more closely at this transaction or not. Um, but like, you can't tell somebody who holds both Tesla and Solar City shares that they have to vote them different ways, even though they have decided this deal is good for them as a whole or bad for them as a whole. But they have to vote for Tesla one way and Solar City the other way because. Why is that? Like, it, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and uh, um, so, so it's a real problem for how corporate law is going to deal with this and how much corporate law is going to ignore these kinds of 
diversif like how a diversified investor has these preferences that may not be wealth maximizing at the individual company level. But that's not the problem of the actual voting investor. The voting investor should be voting for what's good for them. Um, I think on climate change, um, just this issue with BlackRock and, and, I know, and, and BlackRock saying, you know, advertising climate change thing, I just have a really, I actually have a really cynical view of it, which I think more of what they're actually doing, which is I think that it's cheap talk. I, um, I think that they are, in fact, BlackRock and Vanguard are the worst votes on climate change in favor of, like, as compared to all institutional investors, they're at the absolute bottom. You have these, um, you know, like headlines, like, oh my God, they voted for one climate change proposal at Exxon once and then rejected every other one. Um, and that's like a big headline, it's a huge change. But they're actually at the very bottom Bottom, which tells me not that they think that this is irrelevant, but they really think its relevance is very, very limited, and they vote that way. I think that um, where they're feeling pressure actually is in the exact opposite direction, that they're afraid of something like um, the SEC and like the Trump administration is making changes right now that will actually in, in, that will regulate them more if they vote in more in favor of the social proposals, and that's the way it's working. And in fact, the Department of Labor has proposed to prohibit ERISA plans or make it really, really hard for ERISA plans to, to vote in favor of social proposals. So that's actually what they're afraid of. So I actually think that um, a lot of the times when, when BlackRock says we vote for these climate change proposals, it doesn't actually display itself in the actual voting behavior, which is a, a different kind of problem, but it's not this problem. And in fact, that's one of the things the SEC is investigating now. Now that um, if they say they are a socially responsible fund or whatever, do they actually cast the votes that way? And the fact is, most of the time, no. Um, uh, um, I, I, um, I just I disagree on like this idea that they can't know what the climate change thing is. I mean, right now, what we're seeing is um, we've seen Europe putting out like really de is starting to create a, a, a rating system that would make it clear what the environmental effects are or environmental impact of various companies. We've seen actual like all kinds of bond offerings where people will pay money, like actual cash money, for a clear sense of exactly what the environmental effects are and, and how green the technology is. Now that tells you something. It tells you that this is something that wasn't on people's radar screens 10 years ago, but when you see billions of dollars of property damage in Houston, um, it now is. And so um, there, and now I'm not saying every single social proposal issue is like that, but I just have more faith that somebody with billions, trillions, trillions of dollars of assets under management, of which they earn millions and millions and millions of dollars in fees on, has a lot of incentives to figure out what the right answer is. And I think the fact that BlackRock and Vanguard or in fact vote in favor of these things so rarely um, tells you that they're taking that seriously. At, at the risk of being the, uh, at taking the role of the too flippant moderator, <laughs> I'm just reminded of a, of a Ronald Reagan quote about uh, that, uh, you know, the, he, he said our, our opponents don't, it's not that they, that they don't know, it's that they know so many things that just aren't true. <laughs> and I, am, I, I do tend to be an Austrian economist uh, by, by inclination, and so my, my concern is always that we think, you know, especially the Europeans, right? They know so many things that just aren't true. Um, <laughs> but uh, but at, at the end of the day, I mean, we, the, the calculations, the, the first question is, can we calculate? The second question is, do we have any real faith in, in whether the calculation can be accurate given the state of knowledge that we have? And, and I, I, I think Anne's point is absolutely legitimate and probably right. Um, I'm just reluctant to, uh, to, to concede that, uh, that we know enough to, to make those calculations. But that's, that's just me. I wondered if, uh, Adriana, did you have any uh, questions of your, of your co-panelists? You, um, we haven't just, given you a chance yet. So. Yeah, no, that's, um, it's kind of <laughs> interesting. So essentially, basically everything, I think, in, in business law can be boiled down to uh, exit versus voice. Right? That's sort of like securities 101. Like you, if you don't like something, you can either not own it uh, or you can try to vote. Right? Like that's it. And so I guess one way to think about what this panel has done is I'm kind of interested in the exit side of the story. Like, do you buy it or not? Um, this idea of locked in capital, this idea of sort of passive ownership. Um, and what I've tried to sell to you is this idea, maybe you're not buying it, maybe you're going to exit on me, uh, is that, you know, this capital is not really locked in. This, so you have exit. Right? Exit and, and allocation decisions are really happening. Uh, I think my co-panelists are kind of primarily interested in the voice side of the story. Um, and maybe this is sort of my asset pricing background uh, coming in. Uh, my focus tends to be on the, the exit side of the story. Uh, so one question I would ask, I guess, as a general matter to my co-panelists, is I don't think anybody is worried. Right? When I think about a, a mutual fund, what I'm buying is a bundle. Right? I'm putting my money in. I'm giving the asset manager the power to allocate my funds. Right? 
And along with that comes other things, all the research, all the other stuff that my asset manager is providing me in this product. And so I don't think anyone seriously thinks that I should be able to go to a mutual fund and say, you know, I really like, you know, you have 500 stocks in your portfolio. I really like 498 of them, um, but I have a problem with what you're doing for the last two. Right, so what I would like to do is like give you the allocation for like 492 of them, but I'd really like for you to, to act differently with respect to two other things. Right, like nobody seriously thinks that that ought to happen. Just like nobody seriously thinks that if I'm worried about climate change, I should be able to go to you know, a BlackRock fund and say, hmm, you know, I'm really worried about, about these five things in your portfolio. So, so I, I really want you to debundle these things. Uh, nobody thinks that's serious. And so, I guess my question would be, why do we think that the voting should be treated differently from the allocation? Because right now, I give my money to the fund, and the fund both allocates the money and also allocates the votes. Right? That's sort of the status quo. And so the question would be, why do we think that there ought to be any difference right, between the allocation decision and the voting decision? Because until we can really answer that question, then actually, I'm not entirely sure uh, how to think about this. Well, I, I actually don't think the, I mean, like, well, let me say this way. I'm, I have not taken a clear position. Like, I mean, to the extent the allocation decisions are in the voting position, that would be something like the pass-through voting. And I, Sean is really more in favor of that than, than, than I am. Um, but I, I actually would, at least for starters, keep them together because I don't think it's workable for a bunch of reasons to separate them. But one thing I do want to highlight about what you said, because I think this is really interesting. So, um, so like, there are a lot of uh, large funds um, or large investors, not mutual funds, but large investors that have said things like, um, I don't want to divest from something. I don't want to use exit. I would rather stay invested and use voting. Like, so um, I think like the Japanese sovereign wealth fund said something like, I don't want to divest from the exons of the world because my problem is if the exons of the world are doing damage to the world, then I would rather stay invested where I can actually have influence. Um, and I, the problem is whether, and, and that's interesting. I'm not sure I take that at face value though. I think what that means is I don't want to forego the profits I make from Exxon, but I need to give, but I need to, <laughs> I, I need to say um, something other than that. So what I'll say is I'd rather, you know, make sure that help them transition to, you know, so I, so, 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 um, but it is a real question like whether as an investor, if you do think Exxon is damaging your portfolio, is the right strategy to just not buy Exxon and hopefully increase their cost of capital? Or is the right strategy to buy shares in Exxon and vote in favor of whatever climate change proposal come up? I don't know what the right answer is. I just, I, I don't trust when an investor says what their actual reasons are. <laughs> uh, I'll, can, I have a slide. So my, just to an the answer, uh, my answer to Adriana's question would be, um, why, so if the question is like, why, why worry about voting and not allocation, or how are allocation and voting different? Uh, allocation is salient. Like when you invest in a fund, you're investing in that fund's objectives for its profit, right? And that's pr that's foregrounded in your mind. Now you could also, as I my pa my paper is it's all opt in. So like you, the time that you invest, you could also invest for these other objectives. But my view is that people don't, right? And voting is not salient. And there are a bunch of finance studies that show that voting's the the value of a vote is zero. Uh, unless, un unless and until there is a contest and then there's, they're valued slightly. So basically voting is not salient at the time of investment and therefore um, it's just an un it's, it, then it becomes val valuable later or not and it becomes something that the fund is able to use to extract rents and so that's what we should uh, worry about. I'll just say one other thing. Anne mentioned the, um, this political football of the Department of Labor's regulations. So the Department of Labor has regulations about how um, ERISA funds or um, pension funds can, uh, how they can invest. They I mean, have all kinds of regulations about it, right? And, uh, but one of the things is whether they can take into account environmental and social questions in their, I don't know if it's asset allocation or just voting. I, I don't Both. know. Both, okay. Both. And that's been a political football. Um, so going back several administrations, the answer was sort of, well, the, 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 regula the regulated issue has been things like they have to vote the fiduciary duty requires them to vote all the time. Um, are they allowed to take into account these things when they vote? Uh, the answer under Obama was yes. Then the answer was under Trump was maybe not. And, and, and I think that just kind of proves my point. Like these are, these are social policy objectives that, um, that regulators have that are trying to be accomplished through private means and that we should oppose. Um, well, I mean, I, well, let me just say, first, I, I think 
I, 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 Department of Labor and the SEC have never said every fund has to vote. What they have said is that they have to vote if they think it's cost benefit to do so, and then they benefit justified to do so. And then they say, well, we think it's going to be cost benefit to do, justified to do so in most public companies because they will be able to use the professional services of something like a proxy advisor. So, but they still get to decide not to vote. And, 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 and I think that's important because it's something that I think the SEC is about to emphasize even more. Um, as far as the, the the, it, the, the ESG thing goes, just to clarify for people who aren't like in the weeds on this, because I think it's really interesting. There's no dispute that if you do the study and if you conclude that voting for this climate change proposal benefits the fund or the plan or whatever, that you can vote for it. Like there, there, that's never been in dispute. Um, but what essential and what has been disputed is if you think if you're trying to achieve a social objective by your vote or your whatever, that is under Department of Labor regulations only permissible if it literally won't make any difference in, in terms of her, it won't harm the plan in any way. And then though, so what you're really left with and where the, the, where the moves are back and forth is essentially the burden of proof. Like if you're gonna vote in favor of social proposals, the Trump administration is going to, or you know, put in place basically regulations that are going to be like, you know, I want to show the, I want to see the spreadsheet that shows exactly why you think this social proposal is going to maximize wealth for the plan. Whereas the Obama administration was, we're not asking you to do that kind of spreadsheet thing. You can't, you just sort of eyeball it and figure it out. Um, and it's interesting because it's really, and but but yeah, I do think that there are social objectives here. I mean, they're not really talking, you know, they're putting it in plan maximization wealth things, but that's not what it's really about. The really interesting thing is how it's literally the opposite in Europe, where in Europe, they basically have adopted essentially, we assume that these social environmental stuff is gonna maximize plan wealth, and we want you to describe how you're using it in your investment, essentially, because we wanna make sure you are. Um, so, and one of the things that's sort of like at play in this space that none, none of us are talking about, because I, I don't know enough, is really, I'm not sure America gets to take the lead here. I mean, Europe is so clearly moving in favor of wanting in investors to be stewards of these kinds of issues um, and keeps moving regulation in that direction. That actually my thinking is that if the SEC just completely refuses to act, America's gonna be following, not leading anyway. I just want to very quickly go back to uh, what Sean said about the salience and the about the invest. You know, the, the idea of like, well, you know, people care a lot about the strategy and they don't care a lot about the voting. And so, and besides, you know, these voting strategies might change downstream. And so, you know, you've got this locked-in capital. And again, I would just ask, um, you know, the when I invest in a mutual fund, I don't know, and I have no expectation of knowing every asset they're ever going to buy. Right? I kind of have more or less an idea of what they're trying to doing. But they can, in fact, if they didn't change their allocation over time, I would be like very upset at them because I would be very unhappy. I would lose a lot of money. So, you know, I, I looked at, suppose, suppose, so I did this uh, empirically. Suppose I just bought the S&P 500 on like January 1st, 1990 and held it and never traded. it. Right? How would that compare to what the S&P 500 has actually done? Right? Turns out I would be lose, you know, I'd have about 60% of the total return. In other words, I'd be giving away 40% of my return by never having this turnover. It is a terrible strategy, don't do it, right? So, and nobody does it because it's crazy. So, you know, the idea, in other words, that investors are sort of determining ex ante exactly what the fund manager is going to do is not true, right? And not only is it not true, right, the basic strategy might be salient, but like I challenge anyone in this room to give me the names of the last 10 stocks on the S&P 500. Right, number 490 to 500. I can't name them, and I wrote a paper on the S&P 500 and how it makes decisions. Like, I don't know what they are, and and I shouldn't know what they are because the whole point of buying a mutual fund is like I don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. Right. So again, sort of the broad strategy is salient, but the specific allocation, the exit and entrance decision is actually not salient, right? And that's sort of the point. And so again, the idea that, well, the voting isn't salient. You know, I might broadly speaking know what they do, but they might change what they do over time. Like, well, yeah, but again, I don't know why that's different in kind from what I'm already doing on the, on the entry exit side. And so that's, again, where I, I kind of think, I'm not entirely sure I, I fully appreciate um, why people are really worried about one and don't seem to be terribly worried about the other. No, I, I do want to point out something about this because it, there's a broader issue here, which is like with it, Sean and I've talked about we're sort of prepping for this, which is basically like why do shareholders vote at all? Like why do we give shareholders a vote? Which is sort of an also unanswered question in corporate law. But one of the things that is often said on this subject is that the big institutions don't have the same right of exit that an, or, that an ordinary person would like. If you have a retail investor who has 500 shares of Amazon, they can sell them if they don't want to. But if you're an index, 
Um, you can't just sell your Amazon shares for two reasons. One, because you have so much of it that if you dumped Amazon, like you would actually send Amazon tumbling, so you can't. But the other reason is, is really because you have to follow the index. Now, one of the insights, obviously, of Adriana's work is that's really not true because have to follow the index. Well, pick, you know, like, like, you know, sort of, but so many index funds are just the list I wrote over here and then oh, licensed it over here. So change the list that you wrote over here. It's, you know, so, so it really actually, once again, calls into play. Like, so, so, so if the argument is institutions have to vote or their voting is more important because they can't, don't have a real right of exit, what Adriana's work is pointing out is, yeah, they kind of do, I mean, almost all of the time, because they can influence the index and they, don't, and they have to follow whatever the index is, but what the index is is not a fixed, is not a fixed thing. And so if they want out of Amazon, I mean, it's not gonna happen with Amazon, but if they want out of Amazon, they can just call up the S&P 500 provider and say, you know what, we really don't want Amazon in the index. Or if they're making up their own little idiosyncratic index, they can decide, I don't want Amazon in my index. Okay, I'm out of Amazon now. So the, the, the importance of the vote then is really called into question by that. Yeah, so that literally is what happened with dual class shares, right? right? So you know, we, there is no S&P 500, no staggered board, but there is an S&P 500, no dual class shares. It's called the S&P 500, right? So they changed their rules in 2017 so that going forward, Companies that have multiple share classes are no longer eligible for addition to the index. And this was literally changed because of SNAP's IPO, right? Like it's unambiguous, that's why this happened. And it's because big investors pushed for it, right? So, you know, it, now, does, is everybody happy with that change? No, plenty of people were unhappy. Why? Because it's a governance decision and there are different thoughts on most governance questions, right? But to say that that's not a governance decision that was made at the index level um, is just kind of like, I think unambiguously false. I, th I think at this point, because um, I, I have a couple of questions, but I'm willing to defer my uh, moderator's uh, privilege of asking questions uh, and fit them in uh, in any gaps that might occur amongst uh, questions from the, from the folks listening. Do do any do we have any questions? Yeah. So uh, we got a we got a, a microphone for you oh. so for the audio. Um, David Snyder, American University. Um, I have a couple questions which are based on somewhere between utter ignorance and enough knowledge to be dangerous. Um, and I'll ask one, and if there's time, maybe uh, I'll get my other one in too. Um, so the first one is really an empirical question. Is it true that, let's just take activist, sort of ES, environmental social uh, stuff. I, I think it would probably play out for other things too, but let's, it's just easier to talk about something in particular. So suppose you have those values. And my understanding is based on the work of, well, there's the uh, Brest and Gilson and Wolfson paper, and then Andrew Winden's follow-on paper, that, that that all washes out in, beyond the immediate short term once you do the modeling based on the, the newest methods. And the earlier research that showed that you had impact on the share value is just wrong. Um, and so I took Sean's point that you know at the retail level that's certainly true, but not necessarily true at the institutional level. But I'm not clear on that. So that's what I'm asking is, is it true that there are so many values neutral investors who will take the other side of a trade that in before very long, any impact on the share price from saying you're in an ESG fund will just wash out, even at these very large levels. And isn't that even more likely to be true, given Anne's work, given that even within fund families, you have funds who themselves might want to take the other side of the trade. So in other words, does it, aside from the governance side, when we're looking at the exit side, is there really any impact on the share price, even at the uh, sort of family level? So you're asking, basically, if I decide to make buy and like you're talking about, I have a fund and I make buy and sell decisions based on my values, like not even like because I want to make an impact. I want to low, I want to raise Exxon's cost of capital basically by not investing in Exxon. That makes it more expensive for Exxon to do business. So that's the theory. Um, so, yeah, as my understanding is that for the most part, those 
findings remain true, that you can't, that if you're talking about a publicly traded company, that you are not going to affect its stock price by saying, I will withhold my investment, and if I can withhold my investment, and you withhold your investment, and you withhold your investment, we all divest, that will essentially cost them money so much that they'll change their behavior because we've raised their cost of capital. Because by raising their cost of capital, what you've essentially said is, you can make even more money if you invest in Exxon now, and there's somebody who's always going to do that. So that, as I understand it, the theory of that is continues to hold, which is why most ESG funds don't claim that if I'm a, investing publicly traded stock, I'm doing it with the purpose of in, impacting behavior by my buy and sell decisions. They will argue I am impacting behavior by my voting decisions. Um, they might be buying bonds to fund green projects and at least suggesting with more or less truthfulness, which is why the SEC is looking into it, um, that they are funding projects that otherwise would not get funded. Because, so they aren't necessarily even making that argument publicly. That said, two things. One is I also believe there are findings about in how in investor taste actually impacts prices. And I'm not sure how well that fits with like, like a taste for corporate social responsibility that, that, that it impacts prices, impacts firm behavior. I'm not sure how well that sits with those findings. But the other thing is, whenever there's a big divestment campaign, like sometimes companies like Exxon or whatever, they create a sort of astroturf, pretend grassroots thing about how, like, you shouldn't divest, you know, except it's being funded by the oil companies. And, and the interesting thing I find is, well, they think the divest campaign is having an impact because they're spending money to try to counter it. So how much should we trust that they know what they're doing there? So I'll just say two things are, are maybe related, not maybe not. There's a, an, uh, to your question, well, there's an old study about um, sin stocks, and I forget the other, th like sin stocks were like tobacco, alcohol, and gambling companies, and then and then then not sin stocks, saint stocks would be the other ones, <laughs> and um, and uh, you you could make money by buying the sin stocks and shorting the other ones. And so, and so I was listening to the radio and somebody was saying, well, this, all these ESG funds are basically creating the same opportunity. So short the, the ESG fund and buy, the, buy everything else. And then the guy on the radio though said something really great, which was, well, it might be that those studies of the sin stocks were driven by the addictive nature of those products. In other words, it's not just good and bad, it's that you become addicted to alcohol, tobacco, and gambling. And so, you know, if we're just talking about petrochemicals, it's not the same. Um, uh, so that I thought was a great study and I wish that I had been involved in it. The other, the other one, uh, so this is the, but the, the other related thing is, let's say that in the public markets, let's say that institutional investors do what I say they shouldn't, and they get really involved in trying to put, you know, attack Exxon, right? And, and so they just, they, they won't hold Exxon or they'll vote against things at Exxon to try to push Exxon down. Um, well, what, if, if markets are efficient and the share price becomes unhinged, right, to the asset value, the value of, you know, their businesses, then what you would expect is a market arbitrage opportunity where instead of being a public market company, that becomes a private market company. So a, a private equity firm would take over Exxon for its business if, it ever if the public market value ever fell below the business value. Uh, my second. I don't see any hands waving in the air, so. Uh, so this sort of leads to my second question, which is, and maybe there's an obvious answer, it just seems so basic. I do not, I've never understood why management cares about what seems like very small concentrations of power. In the neighborhood, they certainly wake up by 5%. They wake up actually well below 5%. If you're wielding something like 15%, you know, they'll like be buying you Christmas presents and stuff. <laughs> so, but why? I, 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 I don't understand it. They can win every single one of those votes. and. So, yeah, sure, they'll take the call. Lord knows everybody will take a call from Larry Fink. But, you know, why do they do anything? And a, a publicist, a, PR, a guy who owns a PR firm here, put it really well to me. He said, all I need to do is to get to the point of four words where I can hear the CEO say, make it go away. And that happens way below, I mean, way, way below any time you think about even winning a vote. Why is that? Because they, so now I, I'm addressed both sides, right? Exit, impact on share price isn't happening. 
Well, it it seems like, it, and then the governance side doesn't seem to work. So what, what's going on? Maybe my co-panelists will have a more philosophic answer. I have a dumb technical answer, which might be it has to do with the quorum rules. So like if you have a quorum requirement for a meeting, so I, I mean this could, this varies with respect to what the issue would be. But if you have a quorum requirement, which is like a third of the outstanding stock has to show up at the meeting in order for the meeting to be valid, then you, and then you win the vote, you win the vote that's held at the meeting with 50% of the, the shares that are present to vote, then you can win the vote for like with 15% or something. You know, like I, I don't, I, so the, off the top of my head, I can't remember what the minimum quorum requirements are. It's usually 50%. So if it's 50, okay, so, but anyway, it would be 50 of the total outstanding and then you win the vote at the meeting with 50% of that. It's, and I thought it was only 50 in mergers, but anyway, the, it's different in different issues. It could be something like that. No, I think, I think quorum is 50. Generally, um, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I know the exa exact scenario you're thinking about. Um, you know, they they didn't seem to take an interest in social proposals when we were talking about those kinds of things. Well, they often the rather than to avoid the proxy battle, they'll just compromise and say, "We'll yeah. do this." Yeah. Oh, oh. At, at percentages like well, you know. But, Below but 5%. Because, well, they're afraid. That, I mean, like, this is the thing with, with the concentration of institutional ownership. Like, okay, so, like, the statistics are something like in 1950, 5% of equities were held by institutions, and today 80% of equities are held by institutions, or 70 to 80%. I mean, it, it, if you've got a hedge fund activist or somebody, they can have a very small stake, and all they have to get do is get Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street in a room, and they're going to swing the vote. So um, managers, ha because voting is more concentrated today, they have to, anyone who's an agitator, even with a very small stake personally, but it's the potential to persuade, and they only have to persuade a handful of people, um, is, is, is potentially a threat. Yeah, so there's a paper uh, in Apple, Todd Gormley, and uh, they basically yeah. find that a, an activist investor who wants to like change something has a better shot at succeeding at firms with more institutional ownership. Um, and that's basically the idea is like, well, I only need to persuade a few people that this is a great idea. Now, the, they view this as a good thing, right? So the title of the paper is Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, because the idea is, look, if, if my idea is harebrained, I'm not going to convince these people, right? But if my idea is good, right, then I, I can convince them and I actually have a shot at getting something to happen. Uh, so they view that as sort of a, a very good news story in contrast to sort of vi highly dispersed retail investors who have no idea what's going on. They're not going to show up to vote um, for you know, all sorts of totally rational reasons. And so you know, one way to think about that is it's, it's kind of a, a really good thing. Um, very quickly on your... Uh, the sort of exit side of that story. So there's a guy named Cliff Asnes. Uh, he runs a fund called AQR. And he's basically been saying for years, like, oh, all these people that, that want to invest in, you know, saintly stuff, uh, and they want to divest the sin stocks, like, this is great. They make me money. Uh, because, and if you just think about it again, he's a, he's a finance guy, numerator, denominator. Right? The numerator is the cash flows of the company. The denominator is the risk-free rate, right? the cost of capital. Uh, so, you know, if all you're doing, if you're not changing what the company's actually doing, then the cash flows are unchanged, and all you're doing is increasing the return that he gets as an investor. Of course, the caveat to that is it assumes that the numerator doesn't change. And one way to change the numerator is to, you know, vote or whatever. Uh, another way to change the numerator is to sufficiently scare the firm, right? So I threaten not to buy. And because the firm, for whatever reason, doesn't want to upset these large institutional investors, it changes its behavior on its own. And of course, in equilibrium, you don't observe any changes because you know, things happen gradually, and you don't see this sharp threat of not buying, and then all of a sudden, things change. So it's kind of hard to necessarily observe cause and effect. But just to be sort of a little bit cagey, it's certainly true that you, cannot, you shouldn't be able to affect the cost of capital that way. But it doesn't mean that you can't affect their behavior by sort of threatening earlier. Yeah, Gene. Yeah, this is related, but I'm wondering to what degree are the, sort of the general, I'd almost call it corporate culture, of uh, addressing public policy issues in a way they had not in the past, you know, ranging from, you know, the NBA not playing games in certain states because of things the states have done. Um, you, you, you can pick your own example, but there, there, there are a lot of different examples and a, a lot of different uh, uh, effects created. Does that mix in directly with the index funds? Is that, in, is that, is that separate? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kind of curious, but it seems to me it is something which is having gradually a significant impact 
in the country, but I don't know how directly it, inter it mixes in here. So. It's a great question. I don't know empirically if it's true that there's actually more of that kind of thing happening or if with Twitter we just hear about it more. Uh, so that would, be, that, that would be, I guess, an empirical question. The extent to which, so just assuming that it is happening, I don't know how much of it is related to index funds or even large mutual fund families. I, my understanding is a lot of that kind of stuff is driven by pension funds, uh, and those are kind of different, right? They're, they're institutional investors, but they have different types of concerns in some respects. But again, my co-panelists may have other thoughts. I tend to, I think it is happening more um, and Twitter is like partially why, like as in there, it's, a, it, there, it's easier to have a brand reputation risk from certain kinds of behaviors. I tend to think that when companies enter this space, I just, when they say I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do, I think they are lying. <laughs> I think they have decided that there is a market, that there is a market for by not on the investor side, but on the consumer side, on their customer side, for corporate social responsibility, and it is ultimately, you know, on various things. And I mean, like for instance, it's been well documented. There are literally like red and blue brands of jeans, like which I think is amazing. That like you know, Republicans buy this brand of jeans, and Democrats buy this brand of jeans. So, um, so, um, uh, so uh, the the. I think that these companies have decided that it is ultimately wealth maximizing to them because they, by associating themselves with particular causes, they ultimately gain more than what they lose. And, and this notion of uh, you know, uh, saying one thing you know, to, to vert, without the negative connotations of virtue signaling, but, but signaling their virtue in, in various ways, but having other motives, I mean, that's all the way back to Dodge v. Ford, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Henry Ford had lots of good economic reasons for all of the things he did that got him in trouble. But what really made him lose the case was he made a point of saying, no, this is all about being a, you know, he, he wanted to be the philanthropist. No, he just wanted to avoid, you know, worker turnover and all sorts of other terrible right. things that were, you know, going wrong with his business. So he made all these changes, but instead of couching them in, I, this is going to, this is going to be great for my business. He said, no, no, this is, this is about doing good for humanity. And that's why he lost. So it, this is not this is not new. Businessmen have been doing this. Businessmen and women have been doing this for a century now. So I, I would agree with that and put, tie these two together. I, I mean, I think that's true that that stuff's been happening at the it happens at, when it happens in the corporate law. They're often lying uh, because they're trying to maximize wealth by selling to a particular um, consumer constituency or whatever. But I think that's unproblematic from uh, from the perspective that I'm talking about, and, and because of what Jeremy just said, like management, corporate level management has to balance all these different interests in the interest of shareholder wealth, in the interest of wealth maximization or corporate value maximization, and the, one of the interests is who their customers are. Um, but I think that what sets apart the um, mutual fund context is that they're intermediaries that don't have those constituencies, like or that that whose produ the production of wealth does not depend upon those constituencies. So at the corporate level, the production of wealth depends upon making the custom those customers happy who will buy those shoes for that reason and those shoes for the other reason or whatever. And it also depends upon making the employees of the company happy because they have to be willing to work for whatever wage is offered and so on. So there are all these con uh, constituencies to balance at the corporate level, but at the fund level there aren't because the way that the fund makes money is just by the by the way that its portfolio companies make money. So it's appropriate, I would say, for a corporate manager to think about those kinds of issues as a wealth maximization question, and it's inappropriate for a mutual fund intermediary to think about those kinds of issues because its investment return is not driven by them. And I think, if, if I might, and this this is something that I that had a, a, a concern or question, but with regard to Adriana's uh, arguments and it. It seems to me that this reminds me of um, judicial, uh, ju judicial selection methods um, for all the public uh, law people. So this might, might tease your uh, interest. Um, so you know, it, uh, former Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor ran around the country talking about how judicial elections are awful and we have to get money out of judicial selection and we need to move it to merit, pa merit selection panels or you know, I don't know what, what the other options were that, that she was proposing. But at the end of the day, right, power draws rent seeking. The ability to influence draws rent seeking, not the other way around. And so, you know, people who, who supported uh, Justice O'Connor, you know, believed they were getting one thing, and in reality, all they were going to do was move the rent seeking to a different level. Uh, in terms of you know, index funds, people, in, I think people invest in index funds believing that they're getting away from all of the potential rent seeking, all of the the social virtue signaling, and in reality, they're not for the very reasons that Adriana uh, points out. Um, and so, you know. 
you, you still get the cost of the rent seeking. And in fact, the, 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 the veneer of impartiality, of neutrality, might actually create an even greater, even better um, environment for rent seeking because you don't expect it. You're, you're never going to look at an index fund because it's just an index fund. Right? All, that, all they're doing is investing in, you know, they, they just, it's just some formula. Someone came up somewhere and they're bound by that. Well, of course they're not. Yeah, so hot off the press, I just ran this analysis yesterday. Um, so I was trying to figure out, you know, how are the, just to this point, uh, what kinds of things might concern us? So one question I had was, all right, well, look, S&P is made by a public company. Uh, it's S&P Dow Jones, right? It's a public company. All right, they have directors. Now, we know that director board interlock is sort of a thing. So let me look at the companies oh. that have director interlock. And I'm like, surely this is not going to matter. Please tell me. But I had to run it because, oh my god, this is too funny. Um, so Anne can see where this is going. This is going. So it turns out there's a ton of discretion in terms of adding companies to the index. There's actually even more discretion in terms of removing companies from the index. Because again, even if you no longer satisfy the quantitative rules, the committee can choose to keep a company on the index because it's viewed as being kind of like, useful to have continuity, we don't want constant turnover of the index, blah, blah, blah. So it turns out, and this is you know, early results, they might still change, but this has lots and lots of controls. Uh, turns out, if you have a director interlock, so you know, you get company A and company B, otherwise very similar, both on the index. Company A has a board member that is also a board member of S&P. Um, turns out you are much less likely to get kicked off the index. Fun fact, approximately, you know, the probability of getting kicked off is like one third the size. Uh, so that's fun. So yeah, turns out maybe rent seeking could be happening. Yeah. Col color me shocked. <laughs> um, and, and with that, our, our, our time is up. We'd like to, to thank our panelists again for their, for their comments.